This is Newsday. I'm Babita Sharma in London. The headline. A woman has shot and wounded three people at YouTube's headquarters in California. Upon arrival, officers encountered numerous employees fleeing from the building. It was very chaotic, as you can imagine. One victim remains in critical condition. It's believed the shooter then killed herself. We'll have the latest live from San Francisco. I'm Sharon Jutlail in Singapore, also on the programme. Reunited after 24 years, the incredible story of family search that's captivated China and the world. The images that reveal how drones are helping in the fight to save endangered species. Live from our studios in London and Singapore. This is BBC World News. It's Newsday. Thanks for joining us. We start with developing news from San Francisco where at least three people have been wounded in a shooting at the YouTube headquarters in California. Witnesses say a suspect opened fire, sending employees running into the street. We know that at least one victim remains in critical condition. Police at the scene say a woman is suspected of opening fire and is believed to be dead. In a moment, we'll get the latest from our reporter in San Francisco. But first, let's hear from the local police chief who gave an update on what happened when officers arrived at the scene. Upon arrival, officers encountered numerous employees fleeing from the building. Uh, it was very chaotic, as you can imagine. Um, we did encounter one victim with an apparent gunshot wound uh, towards the front of the business as we arrived. Uh, several minutes later, while conducting a search of the premises, uh, officers located a second uh, individual with a gunshot wound that appears to uh, may have been self-inflicted. We are still working on confirming that. Um, two additional victims were uh, located um, several minutes later uh, at an adjacent business. Um, the, the extent of all of the injuries of our victims um, are, are unknown right now. They were all transported for emergency medical care. Well, that was an update from the police there. And a short time ago, a spokesperson from the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center gave us this on the latest of the people being treated there. We've received a total of three patients, and we do not expect additional patients from this incident. We have two females and one male. The females are ages 32. That patient is in serious condition. We have a 27-year-old female in fair condition. And we have a 36-year-old male who is in critical condition. As I said, we do not expect additional patients from this incident. Dave Lee is in San Bruno, the scene of the incident, and joins us live now. And uh, Dave, more information coming out uh, hour by hour about exactly what happened and the shooter herself. Yes, Pavita, we've just been hearing from uh, the police chief here who told reporters a few things that we didn't know earlier. Namely, we know now that the uh, suspect shooter used a handgun to carry out this attack. Um, they wouldn't speak about the identity of the shooter, although we uh, had, to have, had it confirmed that she indeed was a woman. Um, and there are reports from our partners, CBS News, here in the U.S., um, that the man in critical condition uh, may have been uh, the suspect's boyfriend, although when asked about that, in the press conference, uh, the police chief said it was too early to confirm that line just yet. Uh, if I can just update you very briefly on the number of injured and wounded. There was some slight confusion earlier, but we've just had it cleared up. Three people wounded from gunshot wounds, two women and a man, the man that I mentioned earlier. Another person sustained an injury while trying to flee uh, the gun woman. In this case, we understand that person has an ankle injury, which isn't too serious. And of course, as we've been hearing, uh, one dead in this incident, the suspected gun woman. Uh, who died, police say, from a self-inflicted gun wound uh, from that handgun uh, that she uh, allegedly used to carry out this attack. And this attack, uh, Dave, in the heart of Silicon Valley, at the headquarters of a huge global company. 
Yes, absolutely. YouTube's headquarters are just up the road behind me, and the city San Bruno is right in the middle of Silicon Valley. It's surrounded by other cities that are known for having tech companies in them, companies like Facebook. Uh, Google, which owns YouTube, is in a separate campus a little further south. Um, but like many cities in this area, very open, very leafy. This, uh, the, the sort of place these, these companies like to base themselves, and it seems in this incident, um, the gun woman was able to get access to YouTube's campus, which as I say, is just behind me, um, and carry out this attack. When police arrived, which they say took them around two minutes after the initial phone call, uh, they say they saw employees fleeing out of the building uh, in something of a chaotic scene, but just in the last few minutes, Chris Dale, who's YouTube's head of communications, um, said quite emotionally, he said he was in incredibly impressed with law enforcement and how they managed to react so quickly once those nine one calls were coming in. Seen under control now, Dave, but is it still in lockdown? Uh, the employees, some of the employees are still inside. The situation is under control, police say, um, but what they're doing now is working on how to get those employees safely out of the building while they keep it an active crime scene. Uh, many of the employees' cars are all around us in the various parking lots surrounding their headquarters, but gradually as the evening draws on, those employees are expected to be able to go home. Dave, thank you so much for the updates uh, for now, uh, and we'll have more from you later. Dave Lee there, live in San Bruno. Well, we've had reaction to that uh, shooting at the YouTube headquarters from uh, the White House and President Trump uh, tweeting as well. But our correspondent Peter Bowes is in Los Angeles to join us for a little more uh, of that wider reaction that we're getting to this latest incident. Uh, Peter, what are we hearing? Well, yes, the uh, president uh, acknowledging that he has been uh, kept up to date with the uh, developments in uh, San Bruno, just to the south of San Francisco, uh, sending out his uh, thoughts and prayers to those uh, victims and praising the emergency services. We're also hearing other voices uh, speak up on all sides of the political divide, referring to the fact that this is just another example of uh, gun control uh, necessary in the United States uh, to a greater extent than already exists here and, and people calling f for more to be done. And of course this is the e key issue which has dominated the political debate over the last few weeks, uh, especially since that shooting in Florida and then there was that huge march and, and protest in, in Washington DC and other major cities around the country. People including some of the students from that Florida school gathering to draw attention to this issue and calling for more to be done. And Peter, as you say, uh, a huge focus on, on this key issue of uh, gun control uh, and certainly this latest incident uh, happening in such a huge company such as YouTube obviously having impact in, in that particular uh, region and, and that political, political sector as well. Uh, how might the government then potentially react to uh, to more calls for gun control reforms. Well, this is, as you say, a very uh, high-profile company in the uh, age of, of social media. And it's interesting that just a, a couple of weeks ago, in fact, YouTube imposed uh, new restrictions on videos that uh, include guns and weapons, especially guns that were uh, eventually intended for sale. So that highlighted this issue as well. But sadly, uh, it is just one of many that occur almost on a daily basis. And there are many shootings that don't uh, attract uh, as much attention. As, as that one in, in Florida and it's usually because of the number of people or the small number of people injured or even killed in incidents like this and it, and it goes on all the time so it's difficult frankly to see how much difference this particular shooting is going to make in terms of uh, uh, government opinion or the opinion of, of Donald Trump the president apart from the fact that it is so high profile and that it is therefore getting a lot more attention. All right, Peter Bowes in L.A. for the reaction uh, to that incident that we continue uh, to bring you the latest on. Thank you. In other news now, Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Turkish uh, counterpart, President Erdogan, have okay. inaugurated the construction. Turkey's first nuclear power plant. The project's being funded by Russia, having been revived since relations between the two nations started to improve. Talks in Ankara between the two leaders focused on security and trade, and Mr. Putin spoke of their close ties. Uh, Turkey for us is a reliable and constructive partner. 
we work together in resolving the regional and international issues. So in that sense, there is nothing that can tarnish our relationship with Turkey. And also making news today, train services across France have been severely disrupted at the start of three months of strikes in protests at the government's labour reforms. Walkouts will take place on two days in every five. They're protesting against plans to reform employment contracts and to open the state-owned railway company to private competition. The head of Britain's Defence Ministry Laboratory has said it's not been able to verify the precise source of the nerve agent used in the attack on a former Russian spy and his daughter in Salisbury. The lab identified it as Novichok and being military grade, but he said the government had used other sources to piece together their conclusions. And China has confirmed to the World Trade Organization that it is imposing $611 million worth of retaliatory tariffs on U.S. imports, including pork, nuts and ethanol. It's in response to American duties on aluminium and steel. The dispute has raised fears of a trade war between the world's two biggest economies. And now to Beijing, where the story of parents being reunited with their daughter has captivated not just China, but the rest of the world too. The girl went missing aged three in 1994. Now, her father did uh, everything he could to uh, find her, including working as a taxi driver so he could better publicize his search. Um, he had no picture, but the internet and a sketch artist uh, and a simple stroke of luck combined to bring the family together. Our China correspondent Stephen McDonald has the incredible story. After 24 years, a once little girl who disappeared, now a woman, is heading home. Her parents never stopped searching for their missing three-year-old named Chi Fong. Thanks to a relentless social media campaign, the 27-year-old, now named Kung Ying, found them. I never thought this was possible. It's like somebody in a dream has appeared before me. It's unbelievable. In 1994, her father and mother briefly lost sight of their daughter while running a busy fruit stall, and she was gone. Wang Mingqing became a taxi driver, asking customers to help find her via online chat platforms. It worked, and their DNA matches. Today's dramatic reunion has captured the hearts of Chinese people, who know that thousands of children in their country are kidnapped every year, and many sold into adoption. But unlike other parents still grieving for their lost children, this family is finally together again. Stephen MacDonald, BBC News, Hong Kong. Conservationists are borrowing techniques from astronomers in order to survey endangered species. The aim of so-called astroecology is to develop a system that automatically identifies animals from a drone-mounted camera. Our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, has the details. The heat signature of a group of chimps wandering through their habitat. This is a new way of keeping track of endangered species. A little further along, rhinos snuffling the ground for food and these baboons can be seen even through the treetops. Currently conservationists such as Sergio Vich count the animals from the ground. It's a painstaking process and not always accurate. Uh, we have too many areas where we don't know how many animals there are, we don't know where they are and we don't know whether those populations are increasing or decreasing and that's a real problem for conservation management. Here at Nosley Safari Park in Merseyside, Serge is testing out a system that films the animal's heat signature from the air. The drone could spot far more animals from the air, but the problem was that the researchers couldn't tell what they were, especially if they are far away. What they needed was a system that could identify them from the heat they gave off. What Serge needed was the help of an astronomer. Claire Burke uses software that automatically identifies the size and age of stars from the pattern of heat they give off. She adapted it to analyse the pictures from Serge's drone, and she found that different animals have their own distinct heat pattern. Each different species of animals has a unique thermal fingerprint, so they all look different depending on what species they are. And because of this, we can construct a machine learning based 
algorithm which will tell the difference automatically between rhinos and elephants and giraffes and this is what we hope to do with it at the end of the day. The researchers have found that their drone system can successfully identify species at Nosley Safari Park so they'll be trying it out in the wild. If it performs just as well it will give conservationists the detailed information they need to protect the planet's endangered animals. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, Liverpool. Well, you're watching Newsday on the BBC. Still to come on the programme, the Chinese family reunited with their long-lost child. That story we just brought you, we'll be taking a look at the, what the national media are saying about it. We'll still on the programme. Britain's Duke of Edinburgh is admitted to hospital in London when he's to undergo a hip operation. The accident that happened. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon G. Lail in Singapore. I'm Babita Sharma in London. I'll break your news for you this hour. At least three people have been wounded, one critically, after a person opened fire at the headquarters of YouTube in California. The shooter, a woman, is said to have killed herself. A Chinese couple have been reunited with their missing daughter after a 24 year search under the glare of the state media. And dozens of newly discovered giant dinosaur footprints on a Scottish island are helping to shed light on the Jurassic reptile's evolution. And that's a story that's popular on BBC.com. But let's take a look at uh, what stories are popular on the front pages from around the world now. We start with the China Daily, which reports, of course, on that heartwarming reunion story uh, we brought you earlier in the show. Uh, this is about a man who obviously he lost his daughter uh, more than 20 years ago. But he says he made her sweet dumplings for her first meal back home. Now, in the Financial Times, uh, it's uh, asking the question, will Spotify hit the right note with investors? Uh, they look into the company's unusual approach and how it might have been affected by the, uh, the recent slide uh, on tech stocks. And finally, the Business Times here in Singapore is running uh, a story on the uh, platform uh, Grab, that's the ride hailing service here. A uh, story details how it's making a play for more Southeast Asian startups to expand after taking over Uber's regional business. Now, uh, that uh, were the stories uh, that were popular in the papers, but uh, Babita, you've got a story uh, which I kind of just told you about, but it's been sparking discussions mm -hmm. online. Yeah, absolutely. It's because, uh, Sharon, lots of people have been talking about the price of the shares of Spotify, uh, the music streaming firm that surged after trading publicly for the first time on Tuesday. Now, the stock opened at $166, more than a quarter higher than the $132 guide price that was set by the New York Stock Exchange on Monday. Now, it's 50 years since Martin Luther King was shot dead on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, though legal equality was achieved with the Civil Rights Act, Dr. King's dream of full racial equality is unfulfilled. African Americans face higher rates of poverty, unemployment and incarceration. Clive Myrie visited America's most segregated city, Milwaukee, to find out more. Martin Luther King said there were two Americas. One was white, overflowing with the milk of prosperity. The other, black, a lonely island of poverty and brutality. Fifty years after his death, are those two Americas any closer to being reconciled? On the face of it, little's changed at the Martin Luther King Elementary School in the Midwestern city of Milwaukee. 98% of the pupils are black, reflecting the demographic of the local area. So while segregation is now illegal in education, it happens anyway. Fine words, but Milwaukee is the most segregated city in America, where there isn't liberty and justice for all. The north and west are mainly black, the south and east mainly white. In the affluent suburbs, postal workers are the most frequent black visitors. Academic Mark Levine has written extensively about the racial divide here. Milwaukee, in, in terms of the level of segregation in the town, is precisely the same as it was 50 years ago. A black household making $100,000 a year has about a 20 times greater possibility of living in a concentrated poverty neighborhood than a white family. 
And it's not just in housing that America remains a land divided, half a century after Dr. King had a dream. Fifty years ago, the unemployment rate was 6.7%. In 2017, 7.5%, still roughly twice the rate of whites. And 50 years ago, just over 40% of black people owned homes, about the same rate as today. Yet 70% of whites are homeowners. They've been taking everything we have, and now we show them we ain't afraid of them no more. Housing has always been a racial fault line in America. Black people have so often been denied the right to live where they want or refused loans for homes. In 1967, thousands marched for fairness in Milwaukee. They're gonna let me buy a <laughs> and these people were some of the protesters, demonstrating on this bridge the divide between black and white in the city. Walking up the freedom land, the white people with their children and everybody else had bricks and bottles name-calling, there was all kinds of things that happened by the time you got to the end of that bridge. Old newsreels helped jog memories of their sacrifice. That's our mother. That's your mother yes. there. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's my dear mother. But how much do they think things have changed in America? Milwaukee has become more tolerant in, in where they place the blacks. But they're still doing the same thing. They're segregating us, putting us into different areas, though. I don't care. How much money you got, what you got, they're looking at this. Right. But some are fighting back. A non-profit organization, the Milwaukee Fair Housing Council, has undercover researchers who investigate landlords over racism. I met two of the researchers, one black, one white, who went to the same landlord looking for a flat. They were very, very accommodating to me. Um, they were keen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was told there was nothing available and come back later. I subsequently went back about a week later and was told nothing was available. That was it? That was it. It's really disheartening to me because it's a symptom for me of something that's really sick in this society. No matter what I've accomplished, no matter what my station in life, I'm reminded that I'm a black person living in America. Dr. King wanted these children to achieve their American dream and he wanted this country to find its soul. While the evil of inequality pervades, he remains a voice of anguish for millions. I admire it with that report. The Duke of Edinburgh, who's 96, has been admitted to hospital in central London for a hip operation. In a statement, Buckingham Palace said the procedure had been planned would take place on uh, Wednesday at the King Edward VII Hospital. The Duke has missed several recent royal events, as our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, reports. The police officers at the entrance, the sign that there is a royal patient behind the doors of the private King Edward VII Hospital in central London. The Duke of Edinburgh was driven here this afternoon ahead of hip surgery tomorrow. There have been few public appearances from the Duke in recent months. Last summer, he retired from public life his final official engagement, inspecting the Royal Marines on parade at Buckingham Palace. Since then, when he has been seen in public, he's generally looked fit and well. Here, a brisk walk to church at Sandringham on Christmas Day. And even though his hip problems have been bothering him for around a month, he was seen in early March carriage driving, still a favorite pastime at 96 years old. But any surgery at this age comes with risks. There are certain technical risks, but the good news really is that the risks are rare and in fact the outcomes are very good. It's a very reliable way of improving people's pain and improving people's function. I think in a, a gentleman of, uh, in the mid-90s, then clearly there are some anaesthetic concerns, but I have no doubt that, uh, that the Duke of Edinburgh will be very well cared for in that regard. The Duke would usually join the Queen and other members of the royal family for the traditional service at Windsor on Easter Sunday. His absence at the weekend a clear sign that the hip problem had become more difficult. The Queen will remain at Windsor, but is being kept informed of her husband's condition. We wish him a speedy recovery. And you've been watching uh, Newsday. Stay with us because coming up, we'll be in New York, uh, where the arrival of ride hailing apps such as Uber and Lyft have made driving a cab in the Big Apple an increasingly precarious occupation.
And I'm Babita Sharma here in London. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back with the headlines next and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.